We're going to look at the outline concerning spiritual gifts, and you can open your Bibles uh, again to 1 Corinthians 12, or turn on your Bible app to 1 Corinthians 12. A um, couple of quick comments. Uh, Derek and Tom and Tim, uh, thank you for planning this weekend. Um, it, is, it is wonderful pastoral leadership and pastoral care to schedule this so that the church can grow in the gifts uh, which is a, 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 an area that we all need to be growing in, obviously, and your heart to see your church use the gifts in a way that strengthens Sovereign Grace Church and in a way that cultivates unity and in a way that gives Christ glory. So thank you. Just good leadership, guys. Um, one quick question for you, Derek. If I, use the, or if I wear the University of Arizona t-shirt while I preach, is there a greater measure of the Spirit that falls on me during... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, okay. All right, we uh, ended last night on the point that we've got to keep the gifts connected to the gospel. That was a wonderful design of our Lord, so that as we look at this again, uh, we're remembering that, and I'll mention it um, today again. We've got to keep the gifts connected to the gospel. So we're going to talk today After looking at the characteristics of the gifts last night, we're going to talk about specific gifts and define them and remember those gospel connections as we do. I've got a couple of places where I'll try to make those connections for you, but keep that in mind. Uh, Thank you again for giving up a Saturday, significant portion of your Saturday to be here. It's an expression of your desire as Christians to grow in your understanding of and use of the gifts. And it's really a reflection of, of the people we read about in our Bibles. What we see as we see these people that we read in our Bibles, we, we know on the one hand that they, they love God and they love His Word. They are people of sound doctrine, we might say today. And yet they desire and experience the presence of God in their lives. In fact, those two things go to the, together, we believe, if you look at their lives. Sound doctrine and the experience of God. Abraham, for example, in Genesis chapter 12, one of the great covenants, Abraham's covenant that God makes with Abraham in Genesis 12, it's theologically rich, redemptively purposeful, and yet also Abram has this experience with God where he tells him to leave the land that he's in. And as Hebrews 11.8 says, he does so, he follows God in faith, going not knowing where he was going. In Acts chapter 16, we find Paul, who we know had one of the great theological minds of all time, who wrote much of the New Testament. So he was a man of sound doctrine, and yet he had this experience with the Spirit there in Acts 16, where he's prevented to go to Bithynia by the Spirit, but rather through a vision that night directed to go to Macedonia. A wonderful experience of the Spirit of God. So you are a church, whether you're a part of this church or not, who's committed to sound doctrine. Um, and this seminar is a, represent, a representation of that. But you're also a people that have a passionate pursuit to experience God as the, as the Spirit works among you. And one of the ways we experience, I mentioned this last night, the power and presence of God is when we use our spiritual gifts in the power that God gives us. Which is, again, why 1 Corinthians 12-14 through 14 is important to you as an individual Christian and as a church because it addresses the spiritual gifts. So the title of this teaching is Concerning Spiritual Gifts. And let's look again at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1-11. through 11. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that you were, when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same uh, the rise of, excuse me, same, rise of, let me start all over. Now, there are varieties of gifts with the same Spirit, 
and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. May God bless the preaching of the word as the Spirit works among us in a way that strengthens us and brings glory to Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I mentioned this last night. Paul is writing to the Corinthians to address a number of issues, divisions in the church, lawsuits among believers, sexual immorality, pagan idol worship, And then we get to chapter 12, and he says now concerning spiritual gifts. So one of the reasons he's writing this letter is he wants to talk to them about the spiritual gifts. Now, he's not writing the Corinthians because they are unfamiliar with the spiritual gifts. They are actually very familiar with the spiritual gifts. So Paul is writing to them not because they are not using them, but they are not using them in the way that God intends. That's why he's writing them. They are using them in a way that is drawing too much attention to themselves and not to God. And they're actually taking the gifts and measuring their spirituality, their spiritual maturity by the gifts, something that Paul is looking to correct. They they were also using them in public worship services, we will see in chapter 14, in a way that uh, was not in order. And God is a God of order, he says later in chapter 14. So he's looking to adjust that as well. So he's writing uh, this section of the letter to address their understanding and use of the gifts and to bring order to their worship service so that they would be more in unity and they would use their gifts to serve others and not themselves and mostly to bring glory to Christ. So last night we looked at four characteristics of the gifts Uh, This morning, we're going to look at specific gifts, and I'm going to do my best to define them. Uh, We're not going to look at the gift of prophecy. I didn't include faith in this list, but we're going to get through a lot of them. I'm going to move quickly, so write down questions. And by the way, this is the longest outline of the day. Preachers, think about that. You're more awake right now than me trying to do this after lunch, so that's why this is scheduled here in part. Um, Yeah, perfect, exactly. So, just to remind you of the definition that I gave you for the spiritual gifts just overall last night from Boyd Hunt. Spiritual gifts are God empowering His people through the Holy Spirit for kingdom life and service, enabling them in attitude and in action to live and minister in a manner which glorifies Christ. Now, what we've got to keep in mind is this list here in verses 8 through 10 of the gifts is not a comprehensive list of the gifts. It is a representative list of the gifts, representative of the sort of the gifts that were being used there that Paul needed to address. So this is not a complete list of the gifts in Scripture. You've got to look at other Scriptures like Romans 12 and Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. And I want to start with the the gifts or the the utterance is, is what the ESV says or the word, other translations of wisdom and knowledge. And I think to define these accurately and to differentiate the two of them, it's important to know that this is the only place in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 12, where wisdom and knowledge are used like this as gifts. No other place in Scripture besides this chapter right here. So what that means is to understand and accurately define them, we've got to take this chapter and lay it into all of Corinthians, exegete it properly by looking at how both wisdom and knowledge are used throughout this letter. And that's what we're going to do. So let's take, first of all, look at the gift of wisdom, utterance of wisdom, word of wisdom. And again, we've got to keep context in view. If we're going to exegete this and Paul, what Paul's writing to Corinthians, we've got to understand what was going on in Corinth at that time. And at that time, the, the, in the Corinthian culture, there was a high value, 
placed on skilled speakers who could eloquently display their rhetorical skills. That was high value in the culture at the time. And this was a cosmopolitan city. A lot of different nationalities were there, and they prized this. There were these, actually these itinerant philosophers that would travel around who made their way to the city of Corinth where they eloquently communicated their, quote, wisdom, and they did so with wonderful rhetorical skill. In other words, the worldly wisdom of the day was found more in form and style than in content. And that's what the Corinthians were being enamored by, and it was beginning to cause divisions in the church, which was an issue Paul was seeking to address. Uh, They began to follow different leaders based on their eloquence or their rhetorical skill. Another way to say it, the people of Corinth were beginning to be less concerned about the content of the gospel and more concerned with the eloquence of the preacher who preached the gospel. That was an issue that he wanted to address because if, if that were to continue, you begin to lose gospel centrality. So there's a gospel connection for you right there. And this is how Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 through 25. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now listen to what he says here. And not with words of eloquent wisdom. He's automatically contrasting himself to these itinerant philosophers, right? Lest the cross be emptied of its power. That was most important to him. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Those questions are getting at these itinerant philosophers, right? For since uh, a debater of the age, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom but what do we do but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles but to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul is saying in those verses, God made foolish the wisdom of the world by sending Christ who reveals God's wisdom through his death on the cross. That in weakness... The greatest power of God is displayed at the cross, working for our redemption through his death. And that's what's most important, regardless of the eloquence of the preacher. You probably heard the story. Charles Spurgeon was saved in a church he didn't plan to go to because of a snowstorm. And this preacher was not eloquent. He didn't have rhetorical skill. Didn't matter. He preached the gospel. And Spurgeon was born again. That's a modern-day example of what is being talked about here. So with that in mind, here's that's, with that context in mind, here's a definition for wisdom, the gift of wisdom. A word or an utterance of wisdom is a spirit-given insight into some aspect of God's redemptive purposes, which is spoken and results in the edification of others. Now, we'll unpack that a little bit. What the characteristics... It is given by the Spirit, this gift. We see that in chapter 12, verse 8. It is a manifestation of the Spirit. Chapter 12, verse 7. And remember last night what we said, a manifestation is something that was outwardly evident to others. All right? It's obviously spoken. It must be spoken. You can't keep it to yourself. The content centers in God's redemptive work in the gospel. Because that's what Paul's focusing on here as wisdom is being used throughout this letter. He's focusing on God's redemptive work in the gospel. In other words, the content of an utterance of wisdom, the content of a word of wisdom, we say it this way, makes gospel connections in people's lives. It just has a skill and ability to do that. You might think, well, who, 
Who do you know that has a, this gift, this utterance of wisdom? And the, the name immediately comes to mind as a pastor at Covenant Fellowship, Andy Farmer. Andy Farmer is an intelligent man, smarter than me. He's a, he's a wise man. But I'm not saying that wisdom necessarily gives him that gift. Here's what he does with amazing skill that is only empowered by the Spirit, I believe. You can sit down with Andy, and you can tell him what you're facing in your life, or the challenges you're facing at work, and he will begin to just talk with you in a way that he draws you and makes you understand how the gospel is to function as you face that issue, or as you battle that temptation. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Someone who has the ability to do that. Um, it's, it's, um, what I'm trying to say, the next bullet point there, I think I put in your outline, it's not simply human or situational wisdom. It's not simply that. It might be, but it's not simply that. Um, it's not necessarily eloquent. It doesn't have to be, right? That's what we're seeing in, in Corinth. Those who have the gift of wisdom, I think, grow in their gift by reading and meditating on God's Word. That's how they grow in that gift, because this is wisdom. This is God's wisdom that's given to us in, our, in the Scriptures. Wayne Grudem says this in the, one of the books we're going to be given away, The Gift of Prophecy. He says, Most often we gain wisdom through meditation on Scripture. For Paul encourages Christians, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Colossians 3, verse 16. Um, the word of God reveals not only God's wisdom. What does the word of God tell us? is this unfolding story, right, of God's redemptive actions, plans and actions to save sinners like you and me. And that means an utterance of wisdom represents that good redemptive work. All right, let's go to the next one, knowledge. Uh, word of knowledge, uh, utterance of knowledge. Let's look at context again. Paul begins this letter in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 5. I'm not going to read those verses there in your outline there. Uh, encouraging the Corinthians by pointing out that in Christ they have been enriched in all speech and knowledge. And knowledge is a theme in this letter. And we're going to drop in to take a look in one particular case how it's used. So he, he then addresses a specific aspect of the knowledge they have in 1 Corinthians 8 related to food sacrificed to idols. So verses 1 through 4. Now concerning food... Offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. So he's got, got knowledge as a theme. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he's known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, that there is no God but one. So Paul's obviously addressing an issue related to idols and food sacrificed to idols. And there was debate in Corinth, is it okay to do that or not? Um, for a lot of different reasons. And so Paul then addresses it more specifically in, in verses 7 through 13 in chapter 8. And he says, we'll go back to this in a second, this knowledge you have about food sacrifice to idols, it must be regulated by love. That's what he's saying. So, verses 7 through 13, However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will you not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food sacrificed to offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. 
So let's take all those verses and let's put them together and summarize what he's saying. This is what he's saying. He's saying, look, here's what we know. Idols are really nothing. We know that. Food will not commend us to God. Therefore, you could eat food sacrificed to idols. You could do that if it doesn't affect your conscience. However, that knowledge, which is true, must be regulated by love, meaning Will you stumble a weaker brother? And what they mean is not less of a Christian, but just one who has a sensitive conscience to this issue, who doesn't believe it's right for him or her to do that. Will you stumble a weaker brother or sister's conscience by eating food sacrificed to idols? Therefore, here's what Paul's doing. Paul's speaking about a knowledge that has insight into the nature of the world as it exists under God. That's, that's sort of broad. So in this context, knowledge is being used in a broader sense than wisdom is. So with that, here's a definition. A word or an utterance of knowledge is the spirit-given ability to gain insights into and to explain various aspects of the Christian life resulting in the edification and instruction of others. Now let me just pause here for a second. If you come from a Pentecostal background, charismatic background. You've probably heard a different definition of a word of knowledge. Some people will say a word of knowledge functions like this. We're in a meeting like this, and there's a woman here with a red sweater that has back pain, and you want to pray for them. They would call that a word of knowledge. I don't think that's what Corinthians is teaching here. I think what that is, is the gift of prophecy, actually, at work. Um, I think if you're going to exegete this accurately from Corinthians, it's more like the definition I'm giving you. It's a, it's a spirit-given ability to gain insights into and to explain various aspects of the Christian life resulting in the edification and instruction of others. So what were the characteristics? It's given by the Spirit, verse 8, chapter 12, verse 8, is the manifestation of the Spirit, chapter 12, verse 7. Obviously, it must be spoken to edify someone else. The content instructs others biblically, it's an important word, biblically, about how life is to be lived in relationship to God. It's sort of a broad understanding of theology. How does God work in our world today? And how does your life as a Christian fit into that theological world? That's kind of what is another way to say it. It can result in the instruction of others, and it isn't always marked by spontaneous revelation. It just might be because it's this gift that God has given you, although it's spirit-empowered. So, how would this function? Maybe you're talking to a Christian that says to you, how do I work for an unbelieving boss at work? How do I do that? What does the Bible say about that? Uh, How do I think about retirement? What does the Bible say about that? How should I go about educating our children? Um, Those are common questions, right, that Christians can ask. And that's where a person with the gift of knowledge can help them understand how that works in God's theological world. Um, And you think about examples. Maybe you have some folks that are coming to mind. Uh, One of the examples that comes to mind for me is Jeff Perswell. Jeff is a pastor at Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville. He's on the leadership team with Sovereign Grace with me. He is our um, director of theology. So, of course, he must have the gift of knowledge. You might think that. That's not true. Um, Jeff, I'm not using Jeff as an example because he's, he's, he's one of the smartest guys I know. And he is. It's not because of that. Because there are smart guys who have knowledge, but they don't have the utterance of knowledge. They don't know. They can give you information, but they don't know how to help you take that theology and really make it work in your life. Jeff is able to do that on a wide variety of topics. And he does it with a wonderful pastoral skill. Now, you don't have to have pastoral skill to help someone, but what you have to do is you have to take all this knowledge that you have, and you have to, there's a, there's a spirit-empowered ability to communicate it to someone where, like, oh, that makes sense. That's how I can think about re- working for an unbelieving boss. So that's, a, that's what I believe the gift of knowledge is. All right, third gift, healing. I'm going to do this quick. Again, if you've got questions, write them down. Uh, let's begin with this. We believe God heals today. That gift has not ceased. Thank goodness God still heals today, right? Yeah. People who have the gift of healing, they don't heal. That's what you've got to get right on this. People who have the gift of healing, 
don't heal. This gift is not given to draw attention to them, to them because God's the healer. God's the one that heals. But he seems to use those with the gift of healing in a way that when they pray for others, others are healed at times. Not every time, but at times. Uh, people are healed. So here's a definition for the gift of healing. The gift of healing is the spirit-empowered ability to heal physical ailments according to God's will. And you've got to get that last section, in, that last few words into your definition, according to God's will. God's the healer, and he determines if he's going to heal that person today or not. And if he doesn't, that doesn't mean you don't stop praying for them to continue to be healed. It's just not his will to heal them on that day. And maybe he may never heal them because he's got some of their good design for their life through the ailment that they're facing. So don't, don't it's, what I'm not saying is that healing means you, you will be healed every time. God doesn't work that way. because he's As Piper says so well when he talks about the sovereignty of God, you, when something's happened in your life and you're trying to figure it out, you may see one or two things when God's got like 10,000 reasons why he's got things going on in your life. And I think that's true of the gift of healing. I mentioned last night that at Covenant Fellowship, uh, after the, on the fourth Sunday of every month, after we close the service, after we give the benediction, we invite people up for, um, to be healed. And we've had a number of people healed miraculously. Uh, one Sunday, this was a few years ago, I prayed for a woman who came up with her husband, and she had been struggling with a blood disease for, I think she told me, 12 years. Been to doctors. Couldn't figure it out. Been on medication. Uh, it helped regulate it. But she was coming w- once again to be healed. She'd been prayed for before. And so I just prayed a simple prayer for her. Now, I don't know if I have the gift of healing or not, quite honestly. Uh, so I'm not using myself as an illustration of the gift of healing because I'm not sure if I do or not. But I, I just simply prayed for her. Simple prayer that you would pray that God would heal her. Um, she went to the doctor two weeks later. And they draw blood every time to look at her, you know, all her blood numbers. And they were normal. And the doctor was, what's going on? And she goes, well, I, you know, we had people pray for me at my church, praying that God would heal me. So he wasn't convinced. And I, think, I can't remember if he took her completely off some of the medication she was on or reduced it. Saw her again, I don't know, it was a month later. Ran the numbers again. Normal. And he can't. He doesn't have an explanation for it. And so she had an explanation for it. She told the doctor, I know why these these numbers are normal, because God has healed me. We have wonderful stories like that in our church, and may you have them as well. Okay, miracles. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10 again. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. You're kind of working through this list, and you get to verse 10. It's like, okay, now it's going to get crazy with verse 10, right? <laughs> All these gifts I got a lot of question about, and that, that would include miracles. What are, what are miracles? Well, D.A. Carson, in his book, Showing the Spirit, which is Derek's favorite book on this topic, by the way, says the phrase, working of miracles, literally means workings of powers, is how he translates that, those words. So here's a definition. A miracle is a less common kind of God's activity in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. That's a Wayne Grudem definition from his systematic theology. I couldn't improve on that, Uh, just really well done. And then Carson adds this as it relates to the context of this verse that we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 12.10, from his book, Showing the Spirit. Presumably, all healings are demonstration of miraculous powers, but not all miraculous powers are healings. They may include exorcisms, natural miracles, and other displays of divine energy. So, characteristics, it is an extraordinary observable event. It's just out of the norm. It cannot reasonably be explained in terms of human abilities. That's another characteristic. It's perceived as a direct act of God. It is usually understood to have a sign value to it, meaning it's pointing to God as Redeemer, or as Judge, or as Omnipotent. 
for example. Um, some scriptural examples that we see in our Bibles, Peter raises Tabitha Dorcas from the dead, Acts chapter 9, verse 40. Um, and then Paul induced blindness on Elimus, Acts chapter 13, verses 8 through 11. Now, I don't think we see this often today, right? We just don't. Uh, we, we would like to see more and pray for more, but it's not as common. It's, it's, it's more rare in terms of this gift. And I don't know that I've ever met anyone that has this gift, honestly. Have you guys that came with me? Well, gift of miracles. I mean, raising somebody from the dead might be a gift of miracles. It might be that gift. Yeah. My great-grandfather had that experience. Wow, your great-grandfather. Okay. Dan has some incredible stories. They're true. Believe me, they're true. The incredible stories. All right, let's move on. Um, distinguish between spirits. You see that there. Interesting language. And really what that means, here's the definition for this gift, a spirit-empowered ability to distinguish between the works of the Holy Spirit and the works of another spirit, a, deno a, dynamic, a <laughs> demonic spirit or a human spirit. And Carson says this, there is, never, there is ever a need to distinguish demonic forces from the Holy Spirit. The gift is apparently designed to meet that need. Yeah. Maybe not one you would desire, right? In terms of desiring the spiritual gifts. So, scriptural examples. Paul discerns that the power of a slave girl is a demonic spirit in Acts chapter 16. Paul discerns that Elimus, the magician, was demonically motivated in his attempt to oppose the gospel. Acts chapter 13. Those are some examples. And um, I have met with... Uh, People in my church, they'll, they'll come up to me and here's what they'll say. I am having these experiences I don't know what to do with. And they'll, so they'll explain a couple of things. They can be walking down a street and there, there's just a number of shops on the sidewalk and they're just walking along, minding their own business, and suddenly there's this uh, sense they have, feeling is maybe a word also, but a sense they have something's evil. And they're like, they'll stop. What's going on? They'll walk back. I had one woman tell me, she walked back. What did I walk by? And there was a wicker shop there. Um, a wicker shop that obviously is not something that is of the Spirit of the Lord. And so she's like, what do I, what do I, what, what is that? What do I do with that? Or I can talk with uh, another woman in my church uh, who said that she has been around groups of people at times and she gets um, uh, just a, a rare, intense, um, awareness that someone there is, is evil. And what do I, what do, I do with that? What, what is that? And so as I listen to them, I just explain, I think you have this gift distinguished between spirits. And that's what God has given you. It's, you, know, you don't, I don't talk to a lot of people that, that have it, but it's very real to them because of what they're, they're sensing, because of what they're... Um, um, there, there, there's an awareness that they didn't have before of evil, the presence of evil uh, around them. And they're asking, well, what do I do with it? And I, I don't know that I've got the best answers, I tell them, but like the woman that, that walked past the wicker shop, you know, what I would do is just stop there, maybe step a little away from the wicker shop, and, and just pray. Pray that God would shut it down. Pray that God would stop the evil that's there. I think that's a wonderful way to exercise the gift. Uh, or what about the woman who's there with, um, in, a, in a crowd? Um, I, 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 I just say, well, first of all, pray. Whoever you think that person is, pray that if there's evil in their life, that God would rescue them and deliver them. And uh, if you're aware of that person is um, relating to a friend or something like that, then you and I can talk about a skillful way to talk about their friendship. And how do you navigate that with them? Because maybe God's bringing you in there into their lives to, to deliver them out of that relationship. Um, so those are a couple of the ways that I've talked with our folks practically. Um, I think this is also important. 
One of the questions, that, I didn't put this in your outline, about how do we, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin? And you, you see it in the Gospels uh, where the Pharisees are attributing the work of Christ, the powerful work of Christ to Satan. That's what they're doing. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because they're saying the work of the Spirit is the work of Satan. That's what they're saying in those verses. And that's an unforgivable sin, is what Jesus taught. So that's why this gift can be helpful. It can help you sort of avoid that, <laughs> that unforgivable sin in that way. And it makes you aware. So just a, a quick thought on that that I didn't have in your outline. Okay, tongues and interpretation of tongues. We see those gifts there in verse 10. Uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians 14. And we're going to look at this more closely in a little bit. But let's read the first five verses of 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now, what he begins to do here is contrast tongues to prophecy. So he, did, he does that beginning in verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to who? To God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Now, note the contrast. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so there's a gift of interpretation, so that the church may be built up. All right, this is the weird gift, isn't it, tongues? This is the one that makes us squirm in our seat a little bit. And uh, when I first, Joe and I and our family first came to Covenant Fellowship, we came from a cessationist church, a wonderful church that preached the gospel. I was saved in that church. Jill was saved in that church, her before me. We were members of that church for eight years, the first eight years of our marriage. I thank God for that church. And if you're here and you're a cessationist, you are a brother or sister in Christ. And we're going to spend eternity together. That's what you've got to keep in mind when you talk about these things. Um, so, but when I first heard someone very quietly speaking in tongues, it weirded me out big time. I'm like, I don't, I don't know about this. And we kept going back to the church primarily because we were getting good preaching that had just wonderful gospel application. And we would hear prophetic words, and we're thinking, what is that? Once in a while, we would hear somebody silently pray in tongues, and that freaked us out. So it drove us to Scripture, and we had to wrestle. Are we continuationists, or are we cessationists theologically? And after our own study of Scripture, we realized, I think, we think we're continuationists. Now what do we do? And I can remember telling God, look, I'm open to all the gifts except that one. And you know, you should never use the word never when you pray to God. Do you know that? I prayed it. I never want that gift. And I'm happy to report that I do speak in tongues now. Because I was at a, uh, an event, a celebration event in Indiana, Pennsylvania. Um, and there was a ministry time after Terry Virgo preached. I'll never forget the, the night. And it was just, I didn't go down for tongues. That wasn't the purpose of the ministry time. I don't even remember what the purpose was. But a couple of guys laid their hands on me, and I was immediately aware of God's presence, and I began to speak in tongues. It, it freaked me out, honestly. But it also did this. It humbled me. The, the main thing I felt in that moment is that I was in the presence of God. It was like, I, I, I fear God here. I'm on holy ground. And I realized, oh, I can stop this, I can control it, etc. But just be careful praying those never prayers with God, right? So if, if that's your background, you're like, you come here, I'm like, I don't know sure about these, the tongues thing. I, I understand. And yet, note, note what Paul says there in verse 5. He, he says to us that he wants us all to speak in tongues. Well, that's interesting. If we think it's so weird, he wants us all to speak in it. If you go on and read, he says in verse 18, he thanks God that he speaks in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> 
Now, he could have picked a number of things to thank God for, but he was thanking God for that in this particular instance, that he speaks tongues in tongues more than all of us. So Paul didn't think this was a weird gift, and so therefore we shouldn't quickly dismiss it for our own lives. So here's a definition for the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is the spirit-empowered ability to speak in a language you have not learned before. Which is why it says in verse 2 that no one understands the person speaking in tongues. They utter mysteries in the spirit because it's an unknown language that's being used. And we know from verse 2, you saw it there in verse 2, that the language is fundamentally speech that is directed to God and not to men. Um, even, um, even when it's interpreted in a public setting, that interpretation of the tongue should be God-oriented and God-directed. And that's different than prophecy. You saw it there in verse 3. I pointed out the contrast. I put the verse there in your outline. The one who prophesies speaks not to God, right, but to people. For what purpose? For their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Now, the purpose of tongues is different. You see that in, in verse 4. Look at verse 4 again. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. And the one who prophesies builds up the church. So uh, there is self-edification that is given. That's one of the purposes of the gifts of tongues in this chapter is that of self-edification. Where the tongue speaker speaks in tongues, prays in tongues, and is built up in Christ and in his or her relationship with God is strengthened. Now you might say, well, how does that build up the church if it's all about self? That's a good question. But, but think about this. Anything we do as individual Christians, reading God's Word, praying to God, um, using our gifts, including speaking in tongues, that edifies us as individual believers is going to have an effect on the entire church. So if we speak in tongues in a way that deepens our relationship with Christ, so that we love Him more and obey Him more, and you're doing that, if several of you in this church, corporately you're going to be strengthened. So if we're saying, oh yeah, uh, you need to be reading God's Word as an individual, and that's going to strengthen us corporately, if you're going to say that, you've got to say, well, if you've got to get the gift of tongues, you should pray it if it does have that self-edification component, because it will strengthen the church. In addition, there are times when I am praying in tongues, and the Lord just brings a person to mind that I hadn't been thinking about at all. And so I'll just stop praying in tongues and pray for them. Um, and typically when I do that, I'll send them a note or an email or a text just to let them know I'm I praying for them. I remember in one case I I had sent, I can't remember if it's a text or an email, because somebody came to mind that morning, and I, I told them that I spent time praying for them, and they got right back to me uh, fairly quickly and said, what time did you pray for me? I said, well, I don't know, I think it was about 8.30 or something like that, whatever it was. Oh, you, did you know I was about ready to walk into this job interview? No, I had no idea that, I was, that, that you were doing that. It was just the Lord prompting me to pray for you, and that very much encouraged them. Um, I put an addendum. Is that addendum in your... I got thinking about this this morning. It is? Okay. So I have... There are actually three purposes for the gifts of tongues that you see in this chapter. I, I don't... Because for the sake of time, I thought, let me throw them all into an addendum. So the first one we just briefly touched on, that is self-edification. The second one is that tongues can build up the church if there's interpretation. And the third one is that tongues are a sign for unbelievers which he gets into in the, sort of the last half of the chapter. So I just kind of put all my teaching notes in there, and you can read that later, because there are three purposes for the gift of tongues that are in this chapter. So, will all Christians speak in tongues? That's a common question. Short answer, no. Not all Christians will speak in tongues. Some people, some people, not all, speak in tongues after conversion. You see that beyond Pentecost, for example, uh, in the book of Acts, where in Acts chapter 19, Christians are born again and they speak in tongues. However, it's clear in Scripture that not all will speak in tongues. And it's most clear in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 29 through 30. So Paul is asking a series of rhetorical questions that we all know the answer to. The answer is no when he says, 
Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? So that's just one biblical evidence that not all Christians speak in tongues. All right, interpretation of tongues. Let's look at that gift. We're going to move quickly. If a tongue is given in the gathered church, you see here uh, in verse 5, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, that it must be interpreted so that people know what's being said. So what, what Paul does a lot in 1 Corinthians 14, especially in verses uh, 6 through 19, is he spends a lot of time establishing the principle of intelligibility. And the reason he wants to have this principle of intelligibility at work when people use their gifts is that the goal is for the church to be built up. And for you to be built up as a church, you have to understand, it has to be intelligible, you have to understand what's being said. So prophecy does that. You say, oh, now I understand what's being said, that can build up the church. Tongues won't do that on its own. It needs the gift of interpretation in the public context so that it can be intelligible so that the church potentially will be built up. So here's a definition for the gift of interpretation. The gift of interpretation of tongues is the spirit-empowered ability to translate a public utterance of tongues into the language of the congregation. I write that, you could say in English, but if I taught, teach this in Mexico, it, I'd have to say Spanish, right? Um, into the language of the congregation. Now the content of the interpretation of a tongue, as we saw in verse 2, is God-directed, or Godward in nature, and therefore that helps you to know whether the interpretation is accurate or not. The interpretation uh, it needs to be God-directed, and it can be in the form of prayers and praise and expressions of gratitude to God. Mark Stibb writes this, when a tongue is given in public, there is a sense in which the congregation is overhearing the passionate worship of an individual believer, much like what happens when we read the Psalms. These are hymns of praise from a believer or the nation of God. So here's how we do this at Covenant Fellowship. I'm going to end with this story, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, at Covenant Fellowship, there's different practices for how to do this. I'm only giving you a practice here. Um, here's typically how we handle this. Uh, we want to honor 1 Corinthians 14. So it was recently, I was actually responsible for the mic that morning, and uh, there's a man in our church, pastor by the name of Joseph Stagora, and he came up and he said, I've got a tongue. And so I, I, I said, great, you know, and I won't go into a long story what happened after that, but uh, I went over to Jared Melling, our senior pastor, I think Joseph's got a tongue, and he said, okay, I'm going to get up after this song, and I'm going to let the church know that someone has a tongue, and if you think, uh, if you have the gift of interpretation, or if you think you have an interpretation, come forward. And um, so that's what we did. And uh, we, you know, the, the, uh, the worship leader that morning was Sean Smith, I'll never forget. He just kept playing. This kind of played, it took some time. Because what happens, like six people walked up who thought they had interpretation. So that's, that's a lot of management I had to be doing in that moment. Because I had each of them listen to the tongue, so the tongue had not been shared publicly. And then I had each of them share with me their interpretation. So, you know, people are sitting there like, what's, what's going on up there? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I chose the one I did, which is Susan Ashford, because hers was the most, it was fully God-directed and God-oriented. And so I had Joseph share the tongue, and immediately Susan gave the interpretation. And uh, you might say, well, how's that, how does that build up the church? Well, think about this. You, you're aware of the presence of God in this very unique way, and she is extolling God and praising God and thanking God in this interpretation. It was, it was edifying. It was wonderful for us as a church to really listen into, is, is the way I would say it. Now, I also want to say, we don't have these very often. I don't know how, I think it's probably been, that what I just described probably five or six years ago. So they don't happen often in our church. And I don't know why that is. And uh, I don't know if they will happen here, if you've had them here before or not. Have you had them here or not? 
Yeah, and you may or may, may not, but that's how we've chosen to, to go about it. One other way we might do it, by the way, in terms of a practice, we might, somebody might come up and say they have a tongue, and then if we know people in the church who have the gift of interpretation, we might not make an announcement. We might just go to them and ask them to come up and listen to the tongue, give the interpretation, and to decide whether we would have it shared or not. Now, the reason I didn't choose those other interpretations, by the way, were a couple of reasons. One, they were either speaking to people, so it didn't meet the test, or they were kind of speaking to both God and people. And hers was the one that spoke to God. And that's, what, that's why I chose that one. So that's the weird gift <laughs> that works with the gift of interpretation. And uh, it's, a, it's a challenge to lead through. By the way, um, I didn't put this, didn't think about this till now, so maybe this is the spirit. Um, that time that we took to listen to every interpretation and finally share it, 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 felt, it felt like a million years. It was probably five minutes, but felt like a million years. And um, someone came up to me after the meeting and said, that, you know, that took some time, but I really want to thank you that you guys do it that way because it told me you want to honor Scripture. That's what it told me. And so I thank you for that. That helps me to trust you. So, all right, let's stop there.